So hello everyone and thank you for joining us uh, to this discussion today, uh, Regeneration for Climate Resilience. Will the COP26 still rely on false solutions? We are very honored to have with us today three distinguished guests, Dr. Vandana Shiva, founder of Navdanya Research Foundation for Navdanya and Research Foundation for Science, Technology and Ecology, as pres and president of Navdanya International. Uh, Andre Loy, uh, International Director of Regeneration International and the president, former president of EFORM Organics International, and Tom Newmark, co-founder and chair of the Carbon Underground. And I'm Ruchi Shroff, Director of Navdanya International, and will help moderate the discussion today. Uh, this, the discussion today will focus on how true biodiversity-based ecological and cultural regeneration is needed to build climate resilience for the future. Um, we'll have about 15 minutes each to, to present uh, in the first round, and then we leave a few minutes for questions in the end. So please do drop your question in the Q&A box uh, for our panelists to answer. And if you have a question for a specific plan, uh, panelist, please specify. So with the COP26 right around the corner, um, we know we are living in a time of compounding crisis uh, due to centuries of planetary exploitation. And this exploitation is leading us down to irreversible climate change, along with biodiversity erosion, extinction of species, all symptoms of a planetary ecologically, e planetary ecological destruction caused largely by industrialization and the industrial food system, as Navdanya and many other organizations have been consistently denouncing for decades now. Um, we also know that in the name of solving the climate crisis, Large corporations, industries, and lobby groups are now promoting a whole range of ineffective, costly, unproven, and even dangerous technofix solutions, such as the new GM crops, uh, gene editing, artificial and lab-grown foods, geoengineering, biofuels, carbon capture, carbon credits, etc. And these solutions completely deny the power of nature and keep limiting nature's ability to regenerate by attempting to technologically replace the natural processes that have been, that they themselves have been destroying. So as is evident, these techno fixes are really just a way for the industry in partnership with industrial agrotech to be able to continue to pollute while also creating new markets. But as thousands and thousands of movements and organizations uh, uh, you know, practicing agroecology uh, like Navdanya, like the regeneration movement, uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers, peasants, gardeners have been doing uh, for centuries. We have the choice to go down this different path, the path walked by them. And it's the path that acknowledges the central role that food systems have in building climate resilience, as well as regenerating the planet. And this is the path, as Navdanya has shown um, in all its work, uh, that goes hand in hand with nature and her natural processes of cycling carbon, which provide the basis of all life. So it is through this transformative approach as agroecology, as, as, as a practice of regenerative agriculture, that represents the cornerstone of the necessary paradigm shift that we are talking about, that we need for building climate resilience that we need for regenerating our planet, our biodiversity, our local communities, our health and our democracy. So with that, uh, may I invite our first speaker, Tom Newmark. Tom, who is the co-founder and chair of the Carbon Underground and co-founder of the Regeneration International Movement, as well as chairman of the Greenpeace Fund USA, as well as the American Botanical Council and the founder of Sacred Seas and, and the co-owner of the wonderful Finca Luna, Luna Nueva, a biodynamic and uh, regenerative farming operation in Costa Rica. Uh, Tom, we just read uh, your, your recent article on how Mother Nature um, is not a carbon sink. If we could, we could hear from you about how you described uh, in your latest article, how the metaphor of the carbon sink is really not an apt metaphor for thinking about how soil can help us mitigate the climate crisis. And based on your work with the Carbon Underground, as well as the experience at the Finca in Costa Rica, can you tell us how, from your perspective, biodiversity-based agroecological farming is indeed the true solution to build resilience to our ecological crisis? Over to you. Thank you so much, Ruchi. And what a joy to see you again, Ruchi. It's been years since we met in Rome. and. And Vandana and Andre, I can remember our gathering at Finca Luna Nueva 
uh, low those many years ago where Regeneration International was in some respects launched. Uh, the birth party uh, at, uh, at our farm in Costa Rica. And it's such an honor to have been invited to speak with you. Um, Vanden and Andre, you were inspirations to the work uh, of the Carbon Underground and to me personally, and uh, looking forward to this, this conversation. About 15 years ago, I had the pleasure of uh, attending a presentation by Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. And uh, Dr. Lovejoy is one of the world's most famous biologists. Uh, he's said to have coined the term biological diversity, and he was presenting on his work in the Amazon. And after uh, his presentation, uh, Tom and I had a chance to, to speak, and I started asking him about the role of agriculture in meeting the then uh, 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 challenging objectives of the Kyoto Protocol. And Tom said about 15 years ago, it is impossible to meet the carbon budget that we must meet under the Kyoto Protocol without a dramatic reimagination of land use worldwide. So that was 15 years ago. And then in 2009, Vice President Al Gore wrote his book, Our Choice, where one of the chapters in the book basically articulated the, the theories of regenerative agriculture uh, informed by the science of Dr. Ratan Lal. And in 2013, a really important collection of papers was published by the United Nations Commission on Trade and Development. And Andre, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, that publication was called Wake Up Before It's Too Late. That was the alarm clock that went off in 2013. And Andre contributed a remarkable paper, remarkable call to action on the opportunity of regenerative agriculture. So now for 15 years, we've been hearing this from the United Nations, from Vice President Gore, from great scientists around the world, but then the most recent IPCC report came out and it basically gave uh, no attention to the opportunity of regenerative agriculture and agroecology and, and reimagining our relationship with Mother Earth. It, it, did, it did not factor into the vision of the most recent IPCC report. So why? Why this failure? Because we've known this for decades, but why is it not contributing to uh, the, the direction and the leadership that we require from the world? But I have a theory. My theory comes out of the dinner I had at my farm uh, actually about two years ago before, before COVID. And uh, there was a gentleman from uh, a very prominent, I won't name the company, but a very prominent uh, Silicon Valley uh, company, one of the most prominent in the world was there. And at dinner, I'm explaining to this, this gentleman how it's, it's possible using regenerative agriculture that we can help create greater food resilience and nutrient value in foods and help, help with our, our, our water cycle, which is broken. And, and purposes of the conversation, most importantly, deal with our, with our carbon cycle and help draw down carbon from the atmosphere and put it back to work in the earth. And the response from this, this leader uh, from Silicon Valley was, oh, well, that's just impossible. Because, you know, the carbon, the soil sink, it fills up quickly and it's impermanent and it, and it, and it, it does, there's no permanence. And, um, and even at best in the soil sink, we could maybe uh, draw down one to 2% of current anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And I left that meeting and I wondered how is it possible that such a brilliant leader of the, the, the world economy could so woefully, dreadfully misunderstand the relationship of, 
of our planet and our soils to the regulation of the equilibrium needed on Gaia, on Mother Earth to support our life. And I thought maybe it's the term sink itself. Now, obviously the term sink is scientifically appropriate. That is, that is a word used by, by earth scientists to describe the different sinks in which carbon and other compounds can reside, but it limits the imagination to think of our soil as a sink because a sink is a physical structure. And we imagine the sink is something like a bathtub or a sink that, that carbon pours into it and then that's it. But that, that is inconsistent with the reality of what farmers are experiencing worldwide. So uh, also at our gathering uh, in Costa Rica when we launched Regeneration International was Dr. Tim LaSalle. And uh, Dr. LaSalle told me a story recently where on his dairy farm, he put in a fence and the, the bottom wire on the fence was above the ground. And then a few years later, he went back and that wire was now buried at least an inch below the ground. Well, the fence didn't sink or didn't, and that's a complicated use of the word sink. The fence didn't, didn't fall into the ground. The ground rose up and began to engulf the fence. In other words, it wasn't a sink that was stable and that was a physical limiting concept. The soil actually was growing and, and the, the capacity of the, of the soil to integrate carbon into living tissue was expanding. Roland Bunch, and many of you have, have admired the work of, of, of Roland, and he's, he's taught agroecological practices and the use of green manure cover cropping worldwide. And even in degraded soils in Africa, that are in near desert-like conditions. Roland says that farmers by the tens of millions are, in, are creating four to five tons of carbon per hectare per year being integrated back into the soil with an inch or more of new topsoil being grown every year. This is not a sink. This is the use of, of, of Mother Nature's own biological forces, whether you call it regenerative agriculture or agroecology uh, or all the different loving terms we use to describe the way in which farming can produce food consistent with Mother Nature. <clears throat> Soil grows, it's living tissue. And I think that some of the problem that that our leaders have when they're proposing, as you said, Ruchi, these mad, these insane, these hopelessly expensive and, and technologically um, ill-conceived fixes for the problem. The, the idea of spending endless trillions on carbon capture and storage, basically a, a fracking scheme that is doomed to failure. When, when mother nature has the ability we know to integrate carbon into the living tissue of the soil and how much? Well, we've seen the research, uh, the research on holistic grazing shows that somewhere between eight to 10 tons per hectare per year can be reintegrated into the living tissue of mother earth. Uh, there's new beautiful research on row cropping showing that in the the almost 2 billion hectares of arable land on the planet, you can, you can integrate into the soil as much as 11 tons of carbon per hectare per year. So if we stop thinking of, of our planet as simply being this inert physical sink that fills up and then has no further capacity, but instead reimagine 
create a, a create a new relationship, a heart relationship to Mother Earth as as still an athlete in her prime, where if we give Mother Earth and give our soils the care and the treatment they deserve, then we can we can integrate into the living tissue of Mother Earth billions of tons of carbon every single year. It only takes 2 billion tons of carbon transiting from the atmosphere back into the tissue of the soil to reduce the part per, parts per million by one. And with 3.5 billion hectares of grazing land and almost 2 billion hectares of arable land, given the results that we've seen already worldwide in our movement, the, the opportunity to solve our, our carbon crisis, our climate crisis, is before us, it's below us, and it's thrilling. I want to now transition over to my dear buddy, Andre Loy, who in his 2013 uh, paper said, let's stop looking at the farms that don't do a good job, and let's look at the outliers on that bell curve. And let's think about what we could accomplish worldwide if only we were led by the examples of the great regenerative farmers. And Andre, you are one of those great regenerative farmers and I'm honored to pass the baton over to you. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, thank you uh, for this presentation. Thank you for reminding us that mother nature is not a sink or a bathtub, but but living, and she creates life, and 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 we really do need new terminology. Um, thank you, thank you for this uh, uh, for reminding us this. Um, and over to Andre. Andre um, Andre Loy is the international director of Regeneration International. Uh, it's an organization that promotes food, farming, and land use systems that regenerate and stabilize climate systems. Uh, he was the longest serving president of eform organics international um, and is currently an eform ambassador andre is also the author of myths of safe pesticides and poisoning our children he's the co-author with dr shiva of uh, of another book biodiversity agroecology and regenerative agriculture and uh, we, he will also present his latest book today growing life regenerating farming uh, and ranching so Andre, in your new book, uh, Growing Life, uh, Regenerating Farming and Ranching, you explore the fundamentals of regenerative agriculture. Look, thanks so much for the introduction, Richie. And I just want to also thank Tom for Depth his wonderful, wonderful words. Look, I just want to follow on from Tom and thank Tom and actually say that Regeneration International, the seed of it actually came from an event that Tom organized in the Rodale headquarters in 2014 at the UN Climate Summit. And Dr. Vandana Shiva, Tom, Ronnie Cummings, myself and others were there. And as after that meeting, we had the idea and then we formed a steering committee, which Tom was part of and Dr. Shiva. And as Tom said, we actually formed Regeneration International on his farm, his agroecological, biodynamic agroecological farm in Costa Rica, Finca Nueva. So let's, I just want to follow on from Tom and hopefully this will work. Hopefully people can see that. What I want to show here is, is, is a graph. Um, and this is 800,000 years of carbon dioxide. And it's taken from, uh, based on ice cores from Antarctica and Greenland. And what you see is over 800,000 years, we rarely cross the 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide. This year in Manalao in Hawaii, we reached a new record of 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide. You know, in the whole time humanity's existed, we've never been this high. And even with ice cores, we've 
800,000 years, we've never been this high. We have to go back three and a half million years where we use other technology to look at carbon dioxide. And even then it was at 380 parts per million. And these are actually very good papers published in Nature. And the fact is in those days, the world was a minimum of five degrees warmer, five degrees warmer at 380. In fact, at times it was 16 degrees warmer. Sea levels were 20 to 30 meters high. In other words, 65 to 100 feet higher. Think about what New York would look like or Mumbai or Bangkok or the Netherlands or Bangladesh. We're talking about billions of people being climate refugees because they're gonna be underwater. And what I wanna say here is despite the Paris Agreement, things are getting worse. CO2 levels are increasing by two parts per million to 3.3 parts per million per year. And everybody's talking about achieving net zero at COP26, you know, next week. We, if we achieve at this rate, if we achieve net zero, we will be close to 500 parts per million. What does that mean? Well, it, it, it's a catastrophe. It means we cross multiple tipping points towards catastrophic climate change. So the fact is net zero is not enough. We have to go negative now. We should be going negative yesterday, but now we can still do it. And what I need to get across is this, is that, that what we call the legacy emissions, what we've got in the atmosphere now, if we went to net zero, we'll still heat up the world for hundreds of years. We will continue to go into catastrophic climate change with net zero. And what I need people to understand is this. I want you to imagine how much energy you take to boil a pot of water. Now imagine the amount of energy you need to make the oceans one degree warmer, because they're one degree warmer now. How much energy, heat, do you need to make the atmosphere? It's 1.2 degrees warmer now. How much? It's the equivalent of millions, actually billions of atomic bombs worth of energy. And I'm using this metaphor for you to understand what is happening to our climate. Don't think just heat. Think atomic bombs worth of energy violently fueling our weather systems. And that's why we have so many extreme weather events, such as storms, drought, fires, floods, crop failures. They're becoming more intense and more frequent. It's happening now. Every day on the news, there's new disasters all around the planet. And, and if we go to net zero by 2050, things will only get exponentially worse. So let's talk about I'm using the word carbon sink, but after what, because um, that's what the scientists use, but after what Thomas said, I'm going to have to change this and, and, um, and call soils the greatest carbon growth because soils are living and they grow and we need to, we need to actually change, you know, Tom, uh, I'll, from now on, that word will disappear and we will talk about soils as what they are. They're living and they're growing. But, we know that soils store, actually, the latest figures are more than 2,700 gigatons. I've got this from Professor Ratten Lau, but we actually have newer figures. Biomass, which is a forest, that's about 570 gigatons. A gigaton, by the way, is a, million, a billion tons. In the atmosphere at the moment, we have 900 gigatons. But soils actually hold three times the amount of carbon of all the forests in the atmosphere combined. It's the logical place for us to take carbon out of the atmosphere and where do we put it? In the soils where we need it. So we have to start drawing down carbon dioxide now. We need to end fossil fuels and adopt renewable energy. That should be non-negotiable. It's not enough. We need to draw down. At the moment, we need to draw down 26 gigatons, billion tons per year, just to be, you know, neutral, net zero, 26 gigatons, um, just to stabilize it and not make things worse. But 
if we take it up to 30, we go negative. Can we do it with agriculture? Well, let's talk about the most important event that's ever happened in the history of this planet. It's called photosynthesis and it uses solar energy. And it takes carbon dioxide and water in the leaves of plants and it produces a molecule called glucose. And glucose is the energy system that powers all life, all our cells, bacteria, fungi, plants, animals, nearly every living system on this planet, their cells use glucose for energy, all of us. It's the basis of most life. Not only that, glucose is actually the basic building block of all our other molecules of life. All the different sugars, like sucrose, which is sugarcane sugar, or lactose, milk sugar, or fructose, fruit sugar. The carbohydrates we eat, rice, wheat, corn, maize, you know, sweet potatoes. That comes from glucose. It's, it's synthesized by plants. Hydrocarbons, that's oils and fats. That's carbohydrates modified slightly again. Then if you add a bit of nitrogen or sulfur to it, you make amino acids. That's our DNA, our protein, our skins, our hormones, you know, all comes from this incredible molecule that comes from photosynthesis, from the leaves of plants from solar energy, carbon dioxide, and water. Really importantly, what I wanna get across, when we grow plants, while they grow, about 30% of these molecules of life, these carbon compounds, actually are secreted by the roots and go into the soil and feed the soil microbiome the greatest bi area of biodiversity on this planet is fed by these molecules of life. And also when we look at a plant, you know, 95 to 98% doesn't come from the fertilizers in the soil, it actually comes from carbon dioxide and water and photosynthesis and, and those molecules that are made by solar energy in the leaves of plants. This is where, Agriculture and, and agricultural science has got it wrong. They're talking about, oh, we need to bring in all these fertilizers. It's the other way around. 98% of most plants comes from photosynthesis, water and carbon dioxide. And that is what we need to manage to understand the future of regenerative agriculture. So I want to show you here and start Everybody thinks our oh, plants feed from their roots. They feed from their leaves. The roots get maybe two to 5% of nutrients and water, but most of the compounds they have comes from photosynthesis. If we cut the leaves, they can no longer feed the roots. So the plant has to shed roots so it doesn't die. So you can see here with this prairie grass, when you cut the leaves, it sheds the roots. But we can use this knowledge for managing how we farm. Look at the roots of the, the full grown plant and imagine when you cut it and all those roots are shed and, 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 and the soil microbiome feeds on it and releases all those nutrients. How much nutrients are we putting in? Complete fertilizers, the best way to put it, grown by photosynthesis. So we can use this now for our farming systems. And I want to put in the concept now of what we call a cover crop. A cash crop is the crop that we eat or we swap or we sell. A cover crop is one that we grow to feed the microbiome so it feeds our cash crop. In other words, now in our system, we no longer have weeds. We have cover crops that we manage. And if we do it properly by cutting the cover crop, so its leaves are shorter, its roots are shorter, it is no longer competing with our cash crop. It actually feeds our cash crop. This is my farm, I'm a farmer. 
and this is the end of the rainy season. And I want to show you my cover crop, which is uh, tropical perennial grasses and legumes. My neighbours think I'm the, the worst farmer because I let all these weeds get out of control when I should be spraying them. They don't understand that this is life. You know, I, I want to say dead plants don't photosynthesize. Only live plants produce the molecules of life. This is my cover crop. And this is what I've done with my soil. Um, this is 11 years. It, I had, um, if you look at the subsoil, that's what I had. It was low pH, highly acidic, very unfertile. And I built this. I went from 1% to 6% organic matter. I increased all these nutrients. I didn't, in the beginning, I bought some, but most of this has been brought in by the biology, made by the biology. If you look in here, the reason I took this picture, you can see a root of one of my deep rooted legumes coming in, and you can actually see the carbon forming around it. it these are the molecules of life feeding the microbiome and deepening the soil. So my soil is still growing up and down. Like Tom said, it's living, it's not a sink. This is the most incredible area of biodiversity on this planet. Let's look at how we can use this knowledge to start reimagining farming. Instead of going and plowing everything up, spraying it out, putting toxic chemicals and fertilizers on. Let's start working with biology and living systems. So this is one of our innovative farmers in Australia. Work with the laws of nature. Annuals always come up in perennials. So manage the perennials. In other words, graze it down so it's no longer competing. And then what he could, he modified no-till equipment and he could plant his grains in the perennial pasture. When he takes the perennial, the grains off, he can put his animals back on. He's got green pasture. He gets two crops. He's not spending a fortune on diesel plowing up all these pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. His yields are the same as the people spend all the chemicals, I mean, oats is, uh, and then he gets sheep as a second crop, double income, fraction of the price. And this is the soil, and this is work done by Dr. Christine Jones, one of our great soil scientists. And you can see where this is really important is this farm um, was inherited by two brothers, and they put a fence right down the middle of the field. One, one brother just did the standard tillage and grazing. The other, Colin Sice, did the pasture cropping. You can see the deep carbon. He's just growing the soil. Um, he's sequestered an average of 16.8 tonnes of CO2 per hectare every year for 10 years you know, on, on Christine Jones' research. If you look at the increase in nutrients, he, he put a little bit of phosphorus in the beginning because Australian soils are low in phosphorus to kickstart it. The rest of this has been grown by the biology. He hasn't bought this and he's taken two crops off. And then what I want to show here, because you know Tom mentioned how the Silicon Valley and other people are seeing it all the time. Oh, it's impossible. We can't, we can't get these sort of yields. We can't store it. This is another innovative farmer who has improved on the previous farmer. Um, what he's done there is just he once again perennial pasture. Don't plow it up. But what he does with this one, he just breaks up the root mass a bit before he puts the seed in and just um, puts a bit of guano down, you know, natural organic fertilizer with um, his cover crop or cash crop. And this is what we actually call a cow salad there. It's a high biodiversity, 10 species of plants that he grows that he uh, then grazes cattle. He, he, he gets double the um, stocking rate of any of his neighbors uh, yield. But what I wanted to show here, He's the first farmer in the world to be paid for sequestering carbon under a government scheme. First year, he did 11.2 metric tonnes. Next year, 13 metric tonnes under a really tough scheme. This is the sort of numbers that are real and people are getting. 
And remember I said we need to take down 30, um, 30 gigatons to go negative. If we were to extrapolate this across agricultural lands, we're talking 55 gigatons, more than what we need to do. Andrew, we and lastly, I want to... Yeah, this is my last slide. And then, sorry, Richard, and then, then we'll finish, okay? This, this is... I want to finish on this because this is in Northern California. This is a farm that originally 40 no, acres. No, sorry. <laughs> okay. And they went down to two acres. Highly biodiverse, um, agroecological, certified organic. Instead of ploughing, they grow in mulch and compost. Um, they increase their soil organic matter from 2.4% to 7.8%. And this is actually researched by Tim LaSalle from Chico University, Professor Tim LaSalle. What I want to show here is if we would extrapolate this across arable and permanent lands, what they've done when I did the math, that's 179 gigatons. And the reason I wanted to show this was the majority of farmers in the world are five acres or less, two hectares or less. This is less than a hectare. And they actually, by the way, they make 400,000 US a year off this as well. <laughs> so what I want to show is that we have examples that we could scale up, that we can reverse climate change. We, we, we can sequester, plus we can get higher yields just by using mother nature and biology and regenerate our planet. So thank you, Richie, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump right to Dr. Shiva. Dr. Shiva, you've just um, released also a report, uh, Living Earth and Climate Change, and uh, how you've, where you've also described um, the symbiotic relationships that exist between plants, animals, and human, humans. Could you tell us more about this and how they are necessary for regenerating ecosystems, economies, and cultures, as opposed to the false solutions that are being pushed right now uh, which which are only creating, as you call, an eco-apartheid. Over to you. Thank you, Ruchi, and uh, dear Tom and dear Andre, good to have a reunion again. And what it reminds me is that not only do our soils living, they're not a sink and not, soil is an empty container is what the textbooks of agriculture wrote, waiting for the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium to be poured into it. And this empty container attitude, the bio nullius attitude has, is part of colonialism and the fossil age. Andre with his new book, Growing Life, reminds us that what grows is life. And that's why I think two words, that we should really phase out of climate discussion. You know, Tom has said, let's never call the soil a sink. You know, let's recognize the soil is living. The soil is the skin of mother nature and this living earth. And, uh, and Andre has shown how basically carbon is the building block of life. It is the molecule of life. And this language of decarbonization that the fossil empire created is a dangerous language. Many people in the climate movement adopted blindly, which is the segue into all the false solutions. Um, so there's living carbon and there's dead carbon. And Mother Earth fossilized old plants and other living material over 600 million years. Over 3.3 billion, she evolved the plants and then she buried some of them. And we decided we were so smart just 200 years ago that we won't live with the living soil and the living richness of biodiversity. We will mine and we will frack. And that arrogance of the fossilized mind is not just a, a domination over the earth. It is a domination of cultures who were more sophisticated scientifically because they lived as Tom has re repeatedly said, and as Andrea said, they lived according to the laws of nature. And living according to the laws of nature means you live with biodiversity. You intensify biodiversity. You intensify the diversification of biodiversity. Otherwise, how could 
our tribal peasants thousands of years ago have turned one wild grass or as a saliva into 200,000 rice. And how could the Mexican peasants have taken Teosintic and turned them into all the colors of maize? And they're defending it still. They're absolutely refusing the entry of GMO maize and Bayer has just lost a case in the Supreme Court when they appealed, they wanted a removal. And at least in a few places, a few countries, democracy still has a voice. Uh, the climate treaty in 1992 was supposed to both be a reduction of emissions by those who are polluting, as well as climate justice, that those who have polluted are harming those who haven't polluted. Just this last week in my region in Uttarakhand, we've lost 77 people because of untimely rain, unseasonal rains, rains that haven't stopped this year. And then landslides that they've triggered because we're also destroying the biomass, the forests that would protect the mountains. The UN has assessed that India's annual climate destruction is 87 billion. So they reduced the climate discussion in Copenhagen to, oh, we put together 100 billion for the whole world. One country, one season, 87 billion wiped out. And at COP, they're still going to be refusing to take responsibility. We evolved a principle at Rio, the polluter pays. The polluters are still trying to get away. They stole the Kyoto period from us and reduced it to carbon trading. Pollution went up, carbon markets were created, and in a way net zero is, is basically cleverer ways to continue the carbon trading. My friend um, Nemo Basse has called it carbon slavery. Um, the indigenous people have called it carbon colonialism. It is the reductionism that comes from that fossilized mind, the mechanistic mind that turns everything living into death and then actually spreads destruction everywhere. This earlier this year, we had glacial melt and another climate disaster, 200 people died. We've had cyclone after cyclone in the Bay of Bengal and our colleagues, the Navdanya farmer members, their fields, they, you know, they've been saving seeds, they've been doing organic farming, but their fields are under two feet of water. So people who didn't cause the problem are paying the price. People who caused the problem are now, the billionaires are saying, ah, oh, let's make more money from pollution. And a lot of what will happen in Glasgow will be that push. I remember I was working with my environment minister for the Earth Summit and he gave a brilliant speech to stop the arithmetic of genocide because then too, they were working out that for every American, you know, uh, 10 Indians and Bangladeshis are equal to one American. So it's all right, let the damage happen there. Financially, it's totally affordable, yeah? Because life is cheaper in the third world. If a few people die, it doesn't really matter. And sadly, that arithmetic of genocide is coming right back after it was thrown into disrepute. We know, as Tom has reinforced, as Andre has reinforced, you know, my own journey is from ecology to ecological agriculture and regenerative agriculture. And I understood from the beginning that biodiversity is the key. But where does biodiversity come from? Photosynthesis. Where does the soil life come from? Photosynthesis. So we are back to biodiversity, biological production. And my early work on the Green Revolution showed that whether you might measure biological productivity in terms of nutrition per acre, or you measure it in terms of the returns to the farmer, it's a losing enterprise. Industrial chemical agriculture is a losing enterprise. And that's why we evolved the indicators of health per acre and nutrition per acre, which shows that the more you take care of the soil, the more the photosynthesis grows, the more you intensify biodiversity rather than intensify chemicals and fossil fuels, which you can do better on a smaller scale, which is why small farms are more productive. And 80% of the food comes from small farms. The intensification 
of photosynthesis of biodiversity, of biological productivity is the key answer to climate change. Not the intensification of more fossil fuels for more fake solutions. We know Gaia is living. She regulates her climate, she regulates her temperature. And it's because of this that James Lovelock, with working with Lynn Margolis, decided to call her Gaia, the living earth. And, and the data is there, this planet was a carbon dioxide dense planet, 4,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide and 98%. And the living earth reduced it to 270 parts per million to 0 0.03 from 98%. But because it used this amazing photosynthesis that Andrea has described, it took the sunlight, the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, converted it not just into the carbohydrates that are our food, but into the oxygen that we breathe and st which started to cool the climate. Shifting the planet from a carbon dioxide intense planet to an oxygen rich planet. And the average temperatures for a planet without life would be 290 plus minus 50 degrees. And Gaia reduced them to 13. That is why the repeated reminder that working according to the laws of nature, working according to the ecological process of recycling is the way to address the climate problem, because I see the climate problem as a disruption of the Earth's metabolism. If any living system has a metabolic self-regulatory system, when we eat junk food, our body's metabolic system goes into disarray and we get obesity and diabetes and all kinds of metabolic disorders. I see climate change as a metabolic disorder of Gaia as a whole because of a junk diet of fossil fuels. Energy is what makes the world go, but living energy is what kept the earth going. And when we feed her the fossil fuel energy, the metabolic disorder takes place. Rising temperature is one indicator of it. It's a fever. But I see the floods we are having in my mountain regions as a tears. There are, there are tears of outrage. We need to start seeing the earth as living as indigenous people always have. And they had much more science to their knowledge. I view the, the rise of the fossil age, which is you know, 200 years if you take coal and a pathetic 100 years if you take oil. It wasn't just that you took what shouldn't have been used. You should have left the oil underground and lived on the biodiversity and the living soil and the living organic matter. But worse, I think this is the true injustice. It was an injustice to Mother Earth saying that the Earth is dead. And that's why we have a movement on the rights of Mother Earth. But secondly, it took the real caretakers of this world who lived according to the laws of nature and never allowed climate change, never allowed global warming, never allowed greenhouse emissions. They were measured on the yardstick of fossil fuel. Do you use enough of it? Do you have enough plastic? Do you have enough pesticides? I remember in my early days, when I was trying to understand this phenomena called development, every World Bank loan was you don't use enough plastic, have more plastic. Or you don't use enough pesticides, have more pesticides, have the green revolution. And in a way, everyone was driven to basically a captivity to dead carbon. Now that same interest group is trying to push false solutions. I will just run through very, very quickly. The false solutions will continue to be, you know, the denialism on our climate superficially is about denial of climate change. The deep denial is denial of the living soil, the living earth, a living biological matter. That denialism is what goes us into the problem. That denialism is continuing the problem. The first big problem is Mr. Gates trying to do geoengineering and climate engineering because geoengineering is not about what you do to the earth, it's what you're doing to the atmosphere by artificially changing the climate. Now, 
climate engineering cannot be a solution to climate change. More pollution with aerosols cannot be a solution. What was mentioned was the carbon capture. There's a new plant that's been set up in Iceland. It absorbs 0.3%. And the Exxon chief has just announced all of Asia, they're going to take every one of their polluting plants and take a carbon capture. Will they spend the money? No, they're ready for $5 trillion of our public money, which will be going to regenerate the planet, which should be going for compensating those who have lost their lives, their land, their farms. Carbon capture is a hugely inefficient system and Andre laid out how, how the green leaf through photosynthesis is the sophisticated technology. And over these many years of my work, I've realized that all mechanical industrial technologies take a lot of resources, put out a lot of pollution and have one sad function. All living systems take no external resources, have many, many functions and give us many benefits. That photosynthesis is not just enriching the soil with carbon. It's giving us oxygen to breathe. It's giving us food to eat. And this multiplicity of ecological functions is what I call the biodiversity of the mind. Fake food, plant-based food, they call it. And there are enough innocent people who think, oh my gosh, if more processing and more row crops and more buyers spraying more ground up on more GMO resistant crops will save the planet because they don't know about agriculture. And the media is so strong. I've just read today that one of these plant-based companies has gone bust today. Their CEO has left because it's failing. There's new research showing how financially intensive it is, how energy intensive it is. It is actually continuing the industrial agriculture model and will make the chronic disease problem worse because ultra processing is responsible for 75% of all chronic diseases. Add more ultra processing with fake meat and fake blood and fake this and fake that, you can't cheat biology. You can't cheat the gut microbiome. And that's the discussion they're totally avoiding. And that's why reducing everything to carbon. And then the carbon calculus is in their hands. The net zero, I've, I'm so happy India had just said, it's the wrong way to go. Because net zero, you can fix your pollution by taking someone else's land and someone else's forest, further displacing indigenous people, further displacing all small farmers. And that's why it's not an accident that Mr. Gates is the biggest landlord, the farmland owner of America, because this is the way they want to push the one agriculture about which I've written in my book, Oneness versus One Percent, as well as in our Gates to, Empire, Gates to Global Empire report. They are working on this fake calculus. I debated the head of uh, Bank of England, who's now representing the UN on climate change, he actually said the future is finding new markets for offsets. Not a word about healing the planet, not a word about true growing life. Where can I find more money? And they are go going to play every trick under the sun in order to get there. The difference between the food summit, which was high that and climate is the climate movement is a strong movement. It will not that be that easy. So fake food and fake accounting are being totally deployed, but thank goodness some countries are rejecting it. More importantly, the climate summit is going to happen at a time where most of the third world cannot even attend in terms of governments. They'll be absent. And as some people say, at a time when you made vaccines compulsory for travel and you've got a vaccine apartheid, you are going to reinforce ecological apartheid by robbing people of the South, of their democratic voice. People who are suffering are the small island nations. Our mountains have just come back from Ladakh, where the glaciers are melting. Um, are the coastal people suffering soil erosion, more cyclones. So the vulnerable, are the, in the south, the polluters are in the north. And let me just share with you, because a lot of people think the north did a lot to get rid of pollution, but a very, very good article by Jason Hickel, Hickel published in Planet, Lancet, Planetary Lancet said, 
that if they took accounting in terms of responsibility and rights, they've said, US is responsible for 40% of the excess CO2 emissions since Paris, European Union, 29%, the G8 nations, 85%, and according to the Oxfam, 1%, the rich 1%, are the drivers of climate change. So it is about ecology, the laws of nature. It is about Mother Earth and violation of her rights. It is about climate justice at the human rights level. And it is about blindness that was created by the fossil fuel age. What I am so happy about is, you know, we, we came from the margins. When we went to Copenhagen, the, at Navdanya International uh, report the, of the International Commission on the food, Future of Food and Farming, we had issued a report on climate change and food security. That same year, I wrote Soil Not Oil. And all I did was take the data in the IPCC that was in different boxes. They only had agriculture in one box that was about 14%. They did not have deforestation for agribusiness in agriculture. It was just in a different land use box. Uh, transport, the fact that food miles are emitting for one kilogram of food moving 10 kilograms of CO2, that was not in this box, it was in the transport box. Processing packaging was in the industry box. So most of the contributions were left out. And that's why when I started to add the different contributions, at that point, it was about 45%. But if we take today's data, a toxic food system based on fossil fuels and chemicals and ultra processing and long distance marketing is 50%. We can solve this problem, not just for the climate. We can solve this problem for hunger, which is a virus worse than the COVID virus, 11 people dying per minute. We can solve this problem for disease. Local, healthy, fresh food is the answer to all diseases that come from bad food system. We can address, we can reverse biodiversity extinction because most of it is driven by the chemicals which were designed to kill and exterminate. Fertilizers designed to be explosives, synthetic pesticides designed to kill people in concentration camps, herbicide, first Agent Orange, now glyphosate. Agent Orange is an instrument of war during Vietnam. We could get rid of these instruments of war, work with life, life in the soil, life of the plant. And this is the way forward. The fact that we are here, they tried to drown our voice. You remember in the climate march, the largest number of people were farmers. And we said, this is the most important issue. We did not stop. We continued our work. The, uh, the plan was forget the soil. The plan was forget the food. Now they're so desperate, they want to grab our soil and grab our food. We're not going to let them take our land. We will not let them steal our food. We will not let them steal truth and real science. This is our work for the next 10 years and we'll continue to do it no matter how. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiva. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are almost running out of time um, to take questions, but if I could, um, uh, maybe if, if if you want to close the uh, last comment uh, with a minute and if you want to tell us um, about what each and every one can do to ensure a regenerative future. Any any of the speakers. I, th I think that, first of all, thank you, Vandana and Andre, remarkable uh, uh, call to action, very inspiring. Uh, to me, uh, the message is very clear, farming with biological diversity, uh, whether it's green manure cover cropping in the way that Roland Bunch articulates it, our agroecological principles, we should grow our food like a prairie produces food energy and like a forest produces food energy. Uh, we need more and more uh, leaders to embrace this mission. Uh, I think this is an outstanding presentation, which I hope to uh, submit to every world leader that I can. And I thank you for the opportunity to add my voice to uh, Regeneration International and Navdanya. Thank you. Andre or Dr. Shiva, any, any last comments? Uh, yeah, I, I think Look, I, 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 
Uh, well, I just want to really thank both Tom and Vandana. You know, incredibly inspiring words. And I think at the end of the day, what we put out, which is really important, is a message of hope. Mm. And really importantly, what I want to talk about is that, you know, we hear all the negatives and the fact is it could be a negative, but everything that we've talked about is actually being done. It exists. We don't need to invent carbon capture and storage and waste trillions on these new technologies. We, are, you know, we have people doing it now. We have, they're called farmers and innovative farmers on every continent. What we need to do is you know, just use a fraction of one of these stupid carbon capture and storage research. You know, my country has already wasted billions on it and gone nowhere. You know, give us a few million. We're not asking much. And we could turn the world around tomorrow and, 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 and reverse climate change. You know, a fraction of what is being wasted now on these stupid schemes we could turn it around. And, and that's the really important thing I want to get across. It's being done. We just need to scale it up. It's shovel ready. We don't need to invent anything. We just need to empower farmers and, and give them the ability to turn this planet around. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Exactly. This path is already being walked on for, for so long by farmers and gardeners and food producers and movements. And we don't need geoengineering and carbon capture and storage and all of these crazy false solutions. So we either walk the path that continues the violence of the of the industrial food system, or we recognize, as Dr. Shiva said, the earth is living the, the, and we follow uh, her path. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tom, Andre, and Dr. Shiva. Thanks all of you to jo uh, for joining us for this discussion today. You can keep in touch with us. Um, Andre, there were requests if there were sh that if you could share your presentation, uh, yes. if we, could, we could upload it on our website um, where we link to all the articles and books and all the organizations uh, that are also participating in this work. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I'll send it to you soon.